So, Randy, I have a question for you. And um, honestly, when I, when I read this question and I use this sentence, I know it makes evangelical Christians uncomfortable. Almost like last night when we were saying, frankly, it's like we have a fear of happiness. So here's the question. Is God happy? And why does the answer to that matter? Well, this is a, this is a great question and an extremely important one. Because if God is not happy then he has no interest in our happiness, which has apparently been the position that many people have taken. He says, God doesn't care about your happiness. He only cares about your holiness. Well, why would we say that? Well, because God says, you be holy, for I am holy. We know God is holy. We just sang together about the holiness of, of God in that beautiful song. You are holy, Lord. And that's a wonderful thing to praise and worship him for. Should we also praise and worship him for his happiness. And if he is truly happy, wouldn't it make sense that he would want his children to bear the image of his father in being happy also? So the question is not, is not just, is God good, but is God good-natured? That's a hugely important question. It makes a huge difference how we answer that question because who do you want to spend time with? Unhappy people or happy people? Do you want to spend eternity with a supreme being who is not happy, who does not care about your happiness? That's not an attractive proposition, and it's not what the Bible says. And we're going to see that Scripture is actually very clear on this. So help us understand what does the Bible actually say about happiness and start with the Trinity and how that relates to our and his happiness. Well, one of the things that we think sometimes about happiness uh, is that it came into existence when God created human beings and he gave us the capacity to be happy, as though we're not created in God's image. Well, we have the capacity to be happy. We have the desire to be happy. But why? Because we're created in the image of God who has not only the capacity for happiness, he is intrinsically happy by his very nature. But wait a minute. How can he be happy before he created angels and people because there was nobody to be happy in? Doesn't happy almost imply that there has to be someone else or something else beside yourself that you find your happiness in? Well, from eternity past, there's been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see it in Matthew 3 uh, in uh, the baptism. You also see it in the transfiguration, something quite similar. When Jesus was baptized, so you got Jesus, the Son, the second member of the triune God. When Jesus was baptized, behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God, descending like a dove and coming to rest on him, Jesus, and behold, a voice from heaven, and this voice from heaven is obviously the voice of the Father. We know that because of what he's about to say. A voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son. So this is the Father speaking, and he's talking about my beloved Son, the Son that I love. And then he says, with whom I am well pleased. Well pleased is one of many, many, many expressions in Scripture that has an obvious synonym. With whom I am very happy. Who gives me much joy. Who makes my heart glad. What is the difference in meaning of all those expressions? Very little. It's essentially the same. So we have the father being happy with the son, but he didn't just become happy with him at that moment. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God, experienced an eternity of happiness, joy, and pleasure in one another. There was no unhappiness in them. Sin came into the world later. Sin is actually a temporary condition. So sometimes we think, oh, wait a minute, how happy could God really be? Because we see him in Scripture, unhappy with sin. And sin's everywhere, so God must be unhappy all the time. Sin is actually a temporary condition. It's been dealt with on the cross, and it'll be ultimately and eternally dealt with so that forever 
we will enjoy his presence without any sin. There used to be nothing for God to be unhappy about because it was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and pure happiness. In eternity future, there will be nothing for God to be unhappy about. We live in a period of time that's the exception, not the rule. So there is a brief time of unhappiness with sin now, but God does not give up his natural happiness. He is by nature happy, even though he's selectively unhappy with sin, unhappy with Satan. Steve DeWitt, uh, in a great book, um, I think it's called Delighting in the Trinity, something like that, but he says, before you ever had a happy moment, or your great-grandparents had a happy moment, or Adam and Eve had a happy moment, before the universe was even created, God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit were enjoying a perfect and robust relational delight in one another. So think about that. Ponder that reality. Look at what Scripture says about God's happiness. When, it, when Jesus said in Luke 15 uh, about the, the lost sheep, and he says, the shepherd calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying, rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. Well, who is the shepherd representative of? Obviously, it's God in the story. Just like the, the father of the prodigal son is God and rejoices over the return of his son. The shepherd rejoices over finding his sheep, so the shepherd is God. So God says, rejoice with me. Is God joyful? Yes, he finds joy. Or another way of putting it in the Good News translation, I am so happy, I found my lost sheep. Let us celebrate. And then in verse 10, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, it's very interesting the wording of this because it does not say the angels of God rejoice. It says, I'm sure they do, but the point is there's joy in the, their presence before the angels of God. Well, where, who's with the angels of God? Well, God is, and redeemed people are there with him, so heaven is throwing a party when a sinner repents. Look at the nature of God we saw last night, uh, Zephaniah 3.14, where there's actually four different Hebrew words uh, for happiness that are ascribed to us, that we're called upon and commanded to rejoice and sing and be happy and shout with joy and all these things. Well, now, in Zephaniah 3.17, it's talking about God. And here there are four different words, three of which are different than the earlier ones. One's repeated. So in a, in a space of three verses, seven different Hebrew words for being happy and rejoicing are used, these four of God. The Lord your God is in your midst. He will rejoice, that's the Hebrew word sus, over you with gladness, another one, simchat, he will quiet you by his love. Wow. I mean, ponder that for a few million years. Uh, uh, he will quiet, like a child is upset, and he'll take you in his arms. He'll quiet you by his love. And you think that love involves some emotion? You think God's joy involves some emotion? Of course it does. He will exult over you. Another happiness expression the Hebrew word uh, gil, with loud singing. Rena, and this word is often translated to sing with joy. And I think the reason it's not translated that way here is the translators kept, how many times can we keep using joy and gladness words? Well, I would say as many times as they're there reflected in the original language. And there they are. There's four of them. Clear expressions of God's utter uh, delight. I mean, think about that passage. Does that not just... Touch your heart that God would have this kind of love and joy. It's overwhelming, Randy. I mean, honestly, like I was saying in that interview we, we did, is he that good? Yeah. Honestly, is he that good that he would take us in all of our brokenness, all of our complexity, and comfort us? Because, you know, those of us who are parents and grandparents. Right. Whew, yeah. And to have your father do that. Right. The security there is in this. So the happiness of God 
relates to the love of God for us. He takes delight in us. For God to rejoice over us with singing. You know, singing to that child that is being quieted by his love. And uh, it's a beautiful picture. And honestly, you can't wrap your mind and heart around that unless you sense the utter pleasure of God and happiness of God and delight in God, not only in his triune self, but in you, for God so loved the world with adoration and delight and desiring to make the way back to him. Instead of, it is my duty and I will follow him. And the more we talk about our commitment, the more we're talking about us. Exactly. Instead of this irresistible being. Right. If we, if we have this duty-driven rather than delight-driven life, and don't, I don't mean to minimize duty, I don't at all. We are to obey the Lord, but we're to obey him with a happy heart, as one of the passages we saw last night says. But we, we've, got to, we've got to take delight in the one who takes delight within himself Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and takes delight in us. You cannot see this unless you're seeing the happiness of God. So here's what we're told in 1 Timothy 1.11. Paul's talking about the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Now, ironically, this word blessed, which once in common English understanding meant happy, We'll see a little bit later, we can prove that, that, that that's the case. But all of the old writers, they'll talk about the blessed and happy God. He is so blessed, so happy, so... They meant, when they used the word blessed, they meant happy. Well, the meaning of that word has changed a lot. So in the English, when we see this, I mean, when you read the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, do you think of the happy God? That is literally what it means. Same thing in 1 Timothy 6. He who is the blessed, it's this Greek word makarios, and only sovereign, the king of kings and lord of lords. So this Greek word makarios, uh, here's different lexicons pertaining to being happy. Can you explain to us what's a lexicon? A lexicon is like a dictionary. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Uh, it's, a, it's a dictionary. Thank you, Alan, for your contribution to this. Well, uh, hey, but <laughs> you know, that's why they pay me the big bucks. But that's I, right. You pastors are paid to be good. The rest of us are good for nothing. Yes. yes. That's right. right. <laughs> now, that was truth. That was. But actually, the lexicon is kind of a code language for people that don't... Sure, work. it's a dictionary, and so uh, Hebrew or Greek dictionary, dictionary of another language, and so pertaining to being happy. Uh, or uh, another uh, well-known dictionary uh, translates it fortunate or happy. Now, this is interesting because you could say, well, if it can sometimes mean fortunate, when it means fortunate, it's... it's um, you are happy because God has sovereignly provided for you. And in other words, it's not luck. It's good fortune in the sense of God's guidance. Well, is there any sense in which you can call God fortunate? No. That meaning is off the table. So the only one left is happy. You see, you see I mean, God is not fortunate. He gives good fortune, you know, through as a gift. But happy or blessed, the exegetical dictionary of the New Testament says. So, well, happy or blessed, but that word blessed means blessed in the sense of happy. It's old meaning. So this is what this word actually means. A.T. Robertson in his word pictures, Greek, great Greek scholar says, the word translated blessed here in 1 Timothy 1.11, the blessed God, means happy. The happy and alone potentate is how he translates 1 Timothy 6.15. It means happy. And so this comment from uh, John Phillips exploring the pastoral epistles, he says, on uh, comment on 1 Timothy 6.15, we have a happy God, a happy ruler, altogether happy and altogether 
powerful. That's what this means. Many others say the same. Uh, George Knight, the term makarios itself means happy and therefore designates God as containing all happiness in himself and bestowing it on men. The term blessed indicates supreme happiness. The gospel, Spurgeon said, is the gospel of happiness. It is called the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Now, this is what he's preaching on 1 Timothy 1.11. And Spurgeon was a great original languages scholar in addition to everything else he was. A more correct translation, Spurgeon says, would be the happy God. Well, then adorn the gospel by being happy. You see how it's derivative? If God is happy and we're to bear his likeness, if Jesus is happy and we're to be Christ-like, then that's where it's, it's good for us to be happy. The, the New English Bible translates 1 Timothy 6.15, God who in eternal felicity, felicity is an old word that means happiness, God who in eternal felicity alone holds sway. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And think about when Scripture says things like this. Uh, well done, good and faithful servant. Who's the master? Who does the master represent? Clearly God. You have been faithful with a few things. I will reward you by putting you in charge of many things. And then he says these profound words. Come and share, literally enter into your master's happiness. God is saying you don't have to muster up your own happiness and bring it to the table. Enter into my happiness. When you wake up in the morning, you're going through a day and you got challenges and you got physical illness and you got all kinds of things and maybe you've been dealing with depression, you, you don't have to come up with your own happiness. God's inviting you. I who rejoice over you with singing, enter into my happiness. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Often we think the joy we get from the Lord. But the joy of the Lord certainly includes, if not it's the primary emphasis, the joy that the Lord actually has. So God says, enter into a happiness that was mine, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, before the world was created, which has never diminished, which shall always be, and for my children, it is always available to you. Enter in to it now. Now that's an incredible invitation. So if you look at, uh, I'm just going to read one more quote before we move on, uh, and this one uh, from Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, and we've got that over there in the, the bookstore that's part of the coffee shop, and, uh, and also his uh, abridgment uh, of that, smaller one, still big, but uh, called Bible Doctrine. But this is what uh, Grudem says, and if you don't have that systematic theology, I was going to bring it up here, but it's kind of heavy, uh, but, and hold it up, but I, I just highly recommend it. It's just one of those resources that I think every family should have. you got a question about anything, theologically, doctrinally, anything the Bible says, and he deals with it in there, but under the qualities and attributes of God. And let me just say this. Um, the, our women's Bible study, there's a writing team. My wife Nancy happens to be on it, but they have done an incredible job in laying out a study they did. They, they write these terrific studies. And they did one last year on the attributes of God, and it's stunningly good, better than almost anything you can buy in a store anywhere. And I just want to give them credit and recognition for the hard work they do. And they draw a lot uh, from Wayne Grudem, among others. They do a lot of research. But here's what he says about God's happiness. First of all, he calls it what it's been called throughout church history, God's blessedness. So the category is, in bold, it says God's blessedness. And then the first thing he says is, to be blessed is to be happy in a very full and rich sense. There's a part of me that cries out, could we just call it what it is? 
happiness. Because as soon as it says blessedness, it always says, now what we mean by blessedness is happiness. And then same thing, if you see a study Bible and you see Psalm 1, uh, blessed is the one who, blessed is the man who, and, and then you see the footnote, the footnote will always say, blessed means happy. So some of the versions translated happy, and then we've got the benefit of that. But then he goes on to say, makarios, God is called makarios, which means happy. God's blessedness means that God delights fully in himself and in all that reflects his character. This definition indicates to us that God is perfectly happy, that he has fullness of joy in himself. God takes pleasure also in everything in creation that mirrors his own excellence, the happiness of God. And so, Randy, you also say in your book that there are other places in the scriptures that have indirect uh, teaching references to God's happiness. Can you show us some of those? Right. Uh, if you look, for instance, at a passage such as Psalm 2, happy are those who go to him for protection. Well, that Hebrew word, asher, that's translated happy here, appropriately, that's that's truly what it means. Okay, that indirectly tells us that God is happy. How? Well, happy are those who go to him for protection. God can't give us what he doesn't have. God can give us happiness precisely because he has happiness to give. All those who take refuge in him are happy. The oldest and most literal English translations uh, first, the oldest, Wycliffe. Happy be all they who trust in him. And the most literal, Young's literal translation, oh, the happiness of all trusting in him. So we are to be happy, and our happiness is rooted in the happiness of God. Or Psalm 32, too. Happy is the person whom the Lord does not consider guilty. When God forgives your sins, it should make you happy. Well, it can only make you happy if God who forgives your sins is not only holy, but he himself is happy and infusing you with his happiness. Happy is the nation whose God is Yahweh. Happy are those whom you choose. And think of all the other indirect indications of God's happiness in Scripture. I mean, I, um, think of the benediction uh, that we often quote in um, in Numbers uh, 6, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and, uh, and be gracious or bring you peace and lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Or think of um, Matthew 11 where Jesus is saying, come unto me all you who labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. I'm meek and lowly of heart. You'll find rest to your souls. My, my, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. The word happiness isn't used in any of those verses. There's not even joy, gladness, or anything else. But wouldn't you say those are invitations to happiness in God? Wow. And what about happiness as it relates to his creation? What does the Scripture say? Scripture is very explicit on this. It says God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature. His divine nature means all of his attributes— have been clearly seen since the creation of the world being understood through what he has made. Well, what do you see in creation? Well, you see a lot of things that aren't quite what they should be. They're not what God originally designed, so we have to use discernment. We, you know, we can learn from the fact that most animals love their, their offspring and take care of them. And most people love their children and take care of them, but obviously some people abuse their children. And, and, and some animals eat their young, so you don't look at that and say, oh, I guess God must eat his young. No, that you don't make those conclusions about God. You look at, at it in its fullness and its beauty and its obvious trueness to the original, to Eden, to God's original purpose, and you see the attributes of God. So if you look at an otter, you say to yourself, what does an otter do all day? Uh, it, it eats and sleeps and goes down slides. And it water slides. It makes its own water slides. It goes right down the bank and it goes in the water. It swims in its back and it's just, that's what it does. I mean, I'm not saying that should be our model for how we live life completely, but there's things to learn from the otter. Where did the otter get that basic just have fun and be happy? 
Did Satan create the otter? Did it come from him? No, obviously it, it, it comes from God. Our, do, our golden retriever, Maggie, brings delight to us. Okay, so where does that delight come from? Maggie's the secondary creation of God, but through her comes to us the very joy and pleasure of God. So, Randy, um, Jesus is called a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Does that mean he wasn't happy? All right, let me get to that. A couple of other slides that I hadn't, uh, uh, I should have gone on to before, but uh, then we'll get to that question. Even fallen creation reflects God's nature. Uh, Psalm 96, 12, let the fields and everything in them exalt. Then all the trees of the forest will shout for joy. Um, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. It's like creation just, it's like in uh, Romans 8 where it says the creation longs to be relieved of suffering. Well, the creation was made for joy. It was made for happiness. And even you look at an animal that's suffering, and this is the sadness in that, but you also see uh, that, that God had something else. Uh, William Blake said, where others see but the dawn coming over the hill, I see the soul of God shouting for joy. And, and we should do that. Delight yourself in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Why, why does God repeat things? I mean, it's the inspired word of God the first time, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. That should be enough. But it's almost like he thinks, just in case you didn't quite understand what I was saying, I will say it again. Rejoice. By the way, where was the Apostle Paul when he wrote this command? He was in prison. So are you thinking, well, yeah, but Paul doesn't really understand what it's like to suffer. And I face very difficult things in my life today. I mean, I had a flat tire on the way to work, and my, I don't get along very well with my boss. And I go, you know what? If you're here this morning, you're not in prison. And even if you were in prison, it would be a lot nicer prison than Paul was in. And so he does understand what it means to rejoice in the Lord. And then finally, um, before we get on to the happiness of, uh, of Jesus, in Nehemiah 8.10, Go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Isn't it interesting? The sacred day, the holy day, is the happiest of days. God doesn't pit his holiness and happiness against each other. You know, it reminds me, those of us, when we came to Christ and we read Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer, he says, your view of God determines everything. Right. Absolutely everything. And what you're saying is that he is happy he created us to be happy instead of we just think you're only really reverent if you just think right. he is so mad and if I have a moment of happiness, I'm sneaking out right. and doing that on my own. So what we do is we divide sometimes without even thinking this way, but, but that's, that's how we're thinking. It's shown by how we act. We divide the sacred and the secular. So, so like, okay, church, okay, when I'm, if I'm praying, fasting, listening to a message, studying my Bible, uh, or witnessing, or worshiping at church, then those are sacred things. And then the rest of my life, like barbecue and hobbies and sports and driving around on a nice day and riding my bike, those are the secular part of our life. We're to glorify God in all that we do and enjoy God in all that we do. For the, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Okay, so, uh, oh, you made him, referring to King David, happy with the joy of your presence. It's God who brings us happiness. And, and, and it's so important because why would a God who isn't happy care at all whether we are happy? So now we get to this great question about the happiness of Jesus. Uh, first of all, he's called the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Uh, but he's called that in a specific place. It's in Isaiah 53, I think it's verse 6, man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, where it talks about how he will bear the sins of the whole human race to be pierced with our transgressions, to be punished for our iniquities. 
So yes, in that specific context, he's the man of sorrows. But that's not a general characterization of the person and his life. So when you think of Jesus the man of sorrows, think of Gethsemane, sorrow beyond any sorrow any human being has ever experienced because he understood what was happening. He was going to be the Lamb of God who would pay for the sins of the whole world and he would hang from a cross and he would shed blood for all humanity and he would have to say to his own father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That perfect happiness and unity in the triune God. Now, for those moments on the cross when he became sin for us. The grief of that is, is beyond comprehension. So yes, man of sorrows, certainly for that 24 hours, and at other times when he would weep over Jerusalem. But you know what? That was one day out of, if he lived 33 years, I think it comes out to 12,000 some days. So don't take one day in particular out of his life. And so he's always going around the man of sorrows. What we see in Scripture are things like this. This is the first recorded church sermon. It's in Acts 2. It's, it's Peter preaching. He attributes David's words from Psalm 16 to Jesus, the son of David, the Messiah. He has Jesus saying, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, Jesus is saying, my heart was glad. My tongue rejoice, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Referring to the resurrection, you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Okay, those are three references to the happiness of Jesus in the first sermon ever preached. How many times have you heard messages on the happiness of Jesus? There's three in the first sermon. How about Hebrews 1.9? You have, by the way, those of you who were here last night, this, this is the proof of something that I said, which is that Jesus is the happiest person who ever lived. And you say, well, the happiest? What, uh, really? Okay, I can see you could say maybe he's happy, but there's, there's been people a lot happier than Jesus. I'm just sure there, there have been. Well, here's what it says. The inspired word of God in Hebrews 1.9. It's referring to Jesus. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, God the Father, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. In Hebrews 1, the context is the incarnate Son of God, God who has joined the human race and is now part of the human race. Who are his companions? Is it just talking about he's happier than his disciples? No, it seems to go way broader than that. Happier than his companions, that is, the human race that he has become a part of. And I think that's strong biblical evidence that Jesus was the happiest person uh, who ever lived. And look at what Jesus says in Matthew eleven nineteen. 19. Uh, it says, or actually it's what the Pharisees say about him. The Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. We're going to come back to that in a moment because wisdom is justified by her deeds. Why does he say her deeds? Well, it's because the wisdom that he's talking about, because he's talking about what he's doing. So why does he say her deeds? Well, the scholars connect this with Proverbs chapter 8, where it talks about lady wisdom, and the, many of the rabbis believed that the one who's called lady wisdom there, who has existed from eternity past, has been in the presence of the Father, is actually the Son. There it is in Proverbs 8. I was his daily source of joy, and many scholars believe this is a direct reference, this is Christ speaking. The wisdom of God. He's called the wisdom of God in 1 Corinthians. I was his, the Father's, daily source of joy. Always happy in his presence. Happy with the world and pleased with the human race. Until the fall, but even then, 
He finds delight in his people. Jesus said to his disciples, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you. Well, it can't be in us if he doesn't have it. That my joy may be in you. I have joy. I experienced that joy, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, before the world was made, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. He wants our joy to be full. I have told you this, another translation, contemporary English version, which is a good translation. I have told you this to make you as completely happy as I am. Another translation, Phillips. I have told you this so that you can share my joy and that your happiness may be made complete. So think now, when Jesus said, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And what did he say right after that? He said this, in, or it said of him, in that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, the connection of thankfulness and, and rejoicing. So rejoice that your names are written in heaven. But what's the source of your joy? Well, Jesus himself rejoices in the Holy Spirit. So then this uh, couple of quotes here, one from John Flavel, another a Puritan. Christ is the very essence of all delights and pleasures, the very soul and substance of them. As the rivers are gathered into the ocean, so Christ is that ocean which all true delights, uh, in which all true delights and pleasures meet. And then finally, this one from Jonathan Edwards. The beholding of God's happiness will increase the joy to consider that he is so happy. Father's happy, the Holy Spirit's happy, the Son is happy. Those who shall see God will exceedingly rejoice in the happiness of God. I mean, just ponder all of these verses, and that, that's just a smattering of them. There, there's a lot more. So if you ask yourself the question, is God happy? Is Jesus happy? The absolute, emphatically clear, biblical answer is yes, and it's critically important that we understand it, because if we think he isn't happy, then we're going to feel guilty for feeling happy and even for wanting to be happy. Wow. So Randy, take us now in another direction. The relationship between happiness and idolatry. Talk to us. Idolatry is putting, essentially, uh, putting second things first. Uh, C.S. Lewis said it, it's not just wrong to do that, but that when you put first things first, the second things are good. But when you put second things first, you, just, you don't only really commit ad, uh, idolatry, but you spoil the second things for yourself. And so we're told, 1 John 5.21, the last verse of 1 John, it's almost a startling statement that it seems like almost out of the blue. It, it ends with this. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Well, are idols something that we face today? Well, if an idol is anything we put above God, is there anything that we sometimes put above God? Yes. And I think we do that for one implicit reason. We put other things before God because we think, we imagine, that we will find greater happiness in the other things than can be found in loving God, knowing God, walking with God, and obeying God. That's precisely what tempts us. What makes sin attractive to us is that Satan takes this rat poison and he, he wraps it up in this beautiful, bright, shiny, colorful wrapper. And it's just going to make us so happy. Hey, it's rat poison. Sin doesn't bring ultimate happiness. Tim Keller uh, says this, sin isn't only doing bad things, it's making good things into ultimate things. Sin is building your life and meaning on anything, even a very good thing, more than on God. Whatever we build our life on will drive us and enslave us 
Sin is primarily idolatry. Go, go back to um, Augustine who, who said this. This is the happy life, to rejoice to thee, of thee, for thee. For they who think there is another pursue some other and not the true joy. So when we see God as he really is, God as primary and his creation as secondary, then we can look at his creation with the right perspective. Is it right that people would go out and look up at the stars and think of the wonder of the universe and that their hearts would be moved to awe and wonder? You know, when you go and, and stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon, are you doing that because you think so much of yourself and that the real fulfillment in life is just thinking of how great and mighty and big you are? No, the wonder you're feeling is how really, really small you are and how really big this is, and this doesn't even begin to get to what really big is. If you look at the universe and you look at valleys on the planet Mars that uh, 10 Grand Canyons could fit into, and then you think of what exists in the universe that in places we've never been and perhaps we'll be able to go in the new heavens and the new earth, when we look at the secondary that God has made and we enjoy the barbecue, um, is God happy for you to enjoy a D's hamburger? I, I left out the French fries, okay, but I, I'm, no, yes, yeah, so French fries too, but whatever. As a diabetic, the milkshake's probably a little bit out of my league, but. Sweet potato fries. Uh, yeah, right, or go over to Theta's to have her pie and, uh, or whatever it is, but. Can God take delight in that? Do you know how many references to eating and drinking there are in Scripture? It's stunning. Do you know how many times Jesus promised us we would sit down and eat and drink together in his kingdom? They'll come from the east and the west and sit at the table to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we'll feast together. We can take delight in the secondary things as long as we see that God is the primary. And as Augustine was saying, we get into trouble when we think that these other joys are greater than God. God isn't the only joy, but he's the ultimate joy. And he's the one that gives us joy through the secondary. And we see this in Jeremiah 2, uh, where this is a great passage. I think it captures the essence of idolatry and it and has great relevance to the subject of happiness. He says, For my people have committed two evils. First, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. So they've turned from me, the primary. Second, they have hewed out cisterns for themselves, other sources of water. I'm not going to go with God, who's the fountain of living waters. I'm going to turn over here to the water. Well, where does all water come from in the first place? Well, of course, it comes from God. But we're turning from the primary to the secondary. And we're going to take this other water and these other containers of water, hewed out cisterns for themselves. But the problem with these cisterns is they're broken. They can hold no water. There's enough water that you can get a little bit of the quenching of thirst, a little bit of the happiness that God, in, out of his um, general revelation and common grace, gives to all people. He sends the, the sun to rise and the good and the evil and the rain to fall on the good and on the evil. But the ultimate satisfaction of our hearts, we thirst after him, and Jesus said, let anyone who thirsts come on to me and drink. And that's our problem with these idols, these secondary things. It's not simply wrong to go after the idols. It's, it's stupid. It's senseless. It doesn't work. They give us just a taste of happiness and pleasure, but it's temporary, and it does not satisfy us deep in the heart and soul. So Jesus says, if you thirst, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers 
of living water. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Have you ever thought about that invitation? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Find, search for your happiness in God. He gives us a thousand reasons to be happy, most of them revealed in his word that tells us, tell us what Christ has done for us. But then when we see through those eyes, we will see every day full of the kindness of God. So Randy, you referred to this a little earlier. So in terms of uh, being happy, is it okay, and can you show us some scripture? Is it okay to be happy outside of when I'm in a Bible study, when I'm praying, when I'm sharing Christ? We have just made this phenomenal dichotomy that's not from the scriptures. Can you teach us? Well, let's just take this verse, a pretty familiar one to some of us. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, what did he choose as his examples? He could have said, and by the way, this is a good way to study the Bible. When you read what it says, ask yourself, what does it not say? What could God have said? What might I have expected God, given my point of view, which is often wrong, what would I have expected God to have said? Well, I might expect him to say, whether you pray or study the Bible, or go to your small group, or attend church, or share your faith, or worship God, or whatever you do, do all to his glory. He doesn't use those examples. I mean, are we to do those to his glory? Obviously. Whatever you do, it says. But the two examples he uses are eating and drinking. How basic can you get? So when we eat and when we drink, we are to glorify God. We are to honor and glorify God. So we do the secondary thing, eating and drinking. Now we think of that as pretty primary, obviously. It's important. But we do that thing and everything else we do. So when I ride my bike, I ride my bike to the glory of God. And sometimes I have some of the most intense and wonderful, happy and worshipful times with God, just riding my bike. And sometimes I'll get out there and I'll take uh, one of the uh, earbuds and put it in one ear, hopefully staying safe enough, especially when I'm crossing streets, but I'm on the Springwater Trail, and I'm listening often to um, a, a novel, a story. Uh, and so uh, lately I've been listening to uh, Tom Clancy's um, The Hunt for Red October. And uh, a lot of people have seen the movie and haven't read the book, but the book, I never read the book. So listen to the audio, and it's just going, this is a great story. It's fun. It's beautiful. God, you're with me. You're the teller of the great story, the great redemptive story. The story I'm listening to is but a shadow and a reflection of the great story, but the drama of the plot is something you've given me a taste for, a, a desire. Is, that, is God displeased? Now, are there some things I could be, novels I could be listening to that God would be displeased with? Yes. The kinds of things that would lead me towards sin and tempt me and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I'm not tempted to hijack a, a Russian sub. And so I'm fine uh, with that. And so I'm just, I'm just enjoying this story. God's with me. I don't feel like, okay, now I got to go uh, make up for the fact that I rode my bike and listened to a good story. And I got to, like, uh, check off a box and do something spiritual instead. By all means, I should do the spiritual things, the things we normally think of spiritual. But whatever we do, we're to do it to the glory of God. So we can experience greater happiness in the secondary source if we recognize its origin in the primary. People, I can enjoy my dog precisely because I know my dog is secondary. My dog is not as important as people. My dog is certainly not as important as God. I do not put my dog over God. Now, some people actually do. They put their animals above, or they put a family member. They make that family member greater than God. And, you know, that's a, what that does is it not only ruins 
our relationship with God, who's the primary, but it messes up that secondary thing, and the, and the true joy becomes a very uh, a natural and kind of uh, sick one. So Psalm 1611 says, you made known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Is God pro-pleasure? Is God pro-joy? Absolutely. And Spurgeon said, as there is the most heat nearest to the sun, so there is the most happiness nearest to Christ. Does that make sense? It, it just it does to me in a way that probably it didn't at one time in my life. But it so makes sense. And the more you experience, the more you taste and see that the Lord is good, the more you get it. The more you go, I don't have to say, as a rule, I will never watch television again. It's sometimes where, you know, when you get into other things that just drive you more in terms of your joy and you find satisfaction in visiting your neighbor and studying God's Word and listening to, uh, Nancy and I are listening to uh, Focus on the Family drama. You know, the, the radio dramas, uh, they're so great. And there's one called, um, a new one called C.S. Lewis at War, something like that. But it's taking, when he wrote Mere Christianity and it was in World War II when he did radio talks for the BBC. Those things you can delight in, not because television is inherently evil. Some of it is evil. It's not inherently evil. It's not the medium that's evil. I don't, I'm not interested in that when I get my greater joy in other things. So, Randy, uh, secular studies say if you want to increase your happiness, help others and be more grateful. What does the Bible say? Yeah, and it's so funny. I read a number of, when I was researching my book on uh, happiness, I read a number of secular studies, and at times I literally laughed out loud because of what these studies find. People who help other people are happier people. In other words, it, they, they literally will say sometimes like, well, even if you don't really care about people and love people, if you just want to be happier, go help people. And it's like, well, what did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And, you know, look at Isaiah 58, 10. If you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, now before you read on, what would you think it would then say? God will reward you for your great sacrifice. You made yourself miserable, but you helped other people, and God will reward you for this. That's not what it says. That's just not what it says. If you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness. Your gloom will become like midday. Your depression will lift as you help others because you're not thinking of yourself. You forget about yourself when you pour yourself into others and when you lose yourself in God. You remember that time during the Katrina disaster, and I've mentioned this before. When it happened, we're all watching and Theta just sees that TV. She says, Alan, I'm supposed to be there. I am yeah. supposed to be there. Well, as it turned out, you know, the body wanted to respond, and Jonathan sent Theta and another lady, and she spent a week working 14 to 16 hour a day. She came back. She says, Alan, it was the happiest week of my life. And I go, what are you talking about? She says, I had no thought of myself. Mm -hmm. Think of the physicians, and, and some we've had this in our congregation, and others, who take vacation time every year and they can't wait to get back to that poor country where they are saving lives and helping people and removing tumors from children and working those 18-hour days and literally come back from their vacations exhausted and then they can't wait to go back next year. What does that tell you? Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the gratitude part, and this will be a great way for us to wind it up. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Gratitude and happiness, two sides of the same coin. I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng, I will praise you. We have all received grace after grace, grace on top of grace is a literal translation of that, from his fullness. 
G.K. Chesterton, one of the happiest Christians as well as most thoughtful that I've ever read, I would maintain that thanks are the highest form of thought and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Grateful people are happy people. Here's what Matthew Henry said after being robbed. No kidding. And he was known as a very happy man. You can see why. He was robbed. He said, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, although they took my money, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took my all, it was not much. (laughs) And fourth, because it was I who was robbed, not I who robbed. And this is real life. Now you could, yeah, you could say, well, that's putting a good spin on it. Well, yeah, but is anything he said false? Seek to cultivate a buoyant, joyous sense of the crowded kindnesses of God in your daily life. Happy Christ followers notice God's presence around every corner. Lewis said, we may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere incognito. Don't you love wow. that? Huh. I'll just skip to this final quote because we're out of time here. The person who has chosen to make gratitude his or her mindset and lifestyle can view anything, anything through the eyes of thankfulness. The whole world looks different when we do. And our friend, our mutual friend, Nancy Lee, uh, keeps adding names. And so she got married <laughs> Took her for the first time the other at age 57 in November So to Bob Walgamoth, who I also know, another great guy. But, you know, God surprises us. She had joy as a single person. She's having joy as a married person. Gratitude. That gratitude Find uh, another uh, book that came out the same year as Nancy Lee's book is, along with it, I think, the finest book on uh, thankfulness and gratitude I've ever read, and that's Ann Voskamp's A Thousand Gifts. Highly recommend that you read both of these books, and you will find yourself in becoming more grateful, becoming far happier. Randy, why don't you gather your things and make your way out to the table, and I'll mention a couple of practical items, and then we'll stand in a moment and pray. Um, obviously, uh, session three, which is a whole different session, will begin at 1045, and I'm going to select one of you to do the announcements next hour, now that you've heard it twice, okay? <laughs> I really ought to do that, see how you do. <laughs> and somebody goes, he was a lot better than you have been all these years. <sighs> anyway, uh, 1045, we resume. Uh, during the break, uh, the resources are available. I had mentioned that uh, this is a tremendous resource. Having the CDs, um, 23 hours of Randy reading his book is what are on the CDs. And also he's available to sign those. Can I ask you to stand and let's pray. Father, I ask for myself and for all my friends here this morning that we would not resist your goodness. The enemy has picked our pocket. He has scammed us out of the joy and the happiness that Jesus bought and gave us. Relieve us of our fear to come close because you are not only good, but you are good-natured. Oh, Lord, cause us to enter into your joy and for you to spread your joy through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.